If you didn't uh, get a chance last week, this is May's memory verse. We told it to you when we were out in the parking lot, but if you want to write it down, every pew has three by five cards, or there's three by five cards out in the in, at the information center, but we would just encourage you to memorize this verse for the month of May. But everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, for the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Well, happy Mother's Day. And it's, uh, I'm so grateful to gather with you. You know, I have a new appreciation for Psalm 122, which says, I rejoice with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord, to the sanctuary of our God. And, and you know, we didn't know until late. We, we, the accident happened so late last Saturday night, we just uh, gathered the people that were here, Tim and Lisa and Ken and I, and then Paul and Liz were here as well as some young adults, and we just kind of said, what should we do? Because it was too late to send out an email saying, you know, service is going to be, or what we're going to do. And so we just rallied and said, we're going to meet outside and we're going to work it out. And, and I just want to begin by telling you how much we appreciate all of you. You know, we faced adversity together, didn't we? Moving outside was not necessarily easy. Some of us got here between 6 and 6.15 in the morning to set up chairs. And in first service, I froze. I was so cold and I saw people going to get blankets. In second service, I felt like, I'm melting, I'm melting. I was so hot. And I just was like, oh, what are we going to do if we can't be in the sanctuary this week? And I felt like the Lord said, I've got this. I've got this. But, you know, having all of that set up out there, um, I just want to thank you and express our appreciation to you because the cleanup was so easy. So many of you stayed afterwards to help us bring stuff back in. And I just felt like in adversity, we rallied, we faced it together, we bonded, and we're going to be stronger because of it. Yes? So many people came and said to me, Amy, read Romans 8, 28, and I know what that scripture says, but it says, God works all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And we can just trust that God's going to work all things together for good in this. And uh, just to kind of give you a little bit uh, more information, uh, all we've done basically so far is damage control. Like I told you during worship, we actually had to rebuild some of the framing of the, to support that wall. They put up plywood. Now the next step is we have to hire, the, our contractor will hire a structural engineer that will come up, come and look at structure. And I just want to show you some pictures. Some people asked me to put this uh, if you are not on Facebook, ask me to show some pictures. But here's a picture of the car going through the wall. And you can see the brick that's damaged there. And the brick is actually damaged all the way around to this, this side of the, the sanctuary also. Um, and then here, notice the car seat. Six kids in that car. And here's just a picture of the destruction. And, you know, from the outside, it doesn't look as bad. The inside looked worse. Here's the firemen that were coming to help us. And that just gives you some idea. Again, that pew was launched about five feet. All kinds of bricks and debris on the inside. And here's a picture of just the wall that was damaged. But as I said during worship, a miracle can happen now. For the presence of the Lord is here. Amen and amen. You know what? Yeah, let's just give him thanks. Lord, we just give you thanks. We give you thanks again and again and again. We give you thanks, Lord. We want to be people that are always giving thanks, Lord, in the good things and in the bad things. We just give you thanks. So I'm a planner. If you know about my personality, I'm a planner. And I had planned to introduce the book of Acts to you last week and, and then do a section out of Acts chapter 1 today for Mother's Day. And my plans got smashed, puns intended. And um, this week, when we found out that we could be in the sanctuary, I just said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to go back and give the introduction to, Act, to Acts, or do you want me to move forward with Mother's Day? And I just prayed about it and felt like I should move forward and, and talk about what I intended to talk about today on Mother's Day. And so here's my disclaimer, if you will. This is a bit out of order. As a teacher, you want to give an introduction and then teach chapter one. You know what I'm talking about? We're going to do chapter one and then probably do the introduction next week. So this is flipped. It's out of order. And I was praying about that, and I'm like, God, this kind of messes with my world. And I came to the conclusion that even though going out of order might mess with my world, it doesn't mess with God's. 
And one of my life goals, and I'm just a beginner in this, but one of my life goals is that I want that what doesn't bother God wouldn't bother me. What doesn't bother God wouldn't bother me. I want to live that way. So turn with me, if you would, to Acts chapter 1. Again, we are just starting to study the book of Acts together today. And I'm going to give you some tweets here to begin. The first ones kind of relate to the accident and impacted me. The second ones have to do with Mother's Day. But in light of our current, in light of our current situation, sometimes you think you're being buried when you're really being planted. God is using this season to grow you. Yeah? Praise is the switch that turns on the light of joy in our lives, even when it's dark outside. And you know, at 6.30 last Saturday night, when we came in here and saw the destruction in the sanctuary, at 7.30 or 8, when the city inspector said, you can't meet in here tomorrow, it got dark outside. <laughs> but praise is the light switch. Let's live praising him. As Christians, we are a lot like tea bags. We don't know what we're made of until we are put in hot water. <laughs> Here's some in honor of Mother's Day. Parenthood is the scariest hood you'll ever go through. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Most of my tweets I'm going to give you this morning are funny, but this one is deep. This next one I'm going to give you is deep, and I just ask you to consider it. It says this, success is impossible if children are prevented from failing. There is truth in that. We can try so hard to protect our kids' self-esteem or whatever, and then we, prevent, we keep them from failing, but success is impossible unless they learn to handle failure because we all go through times of failure, do we not? You know you're a mother when you understand why Mama Bear's porridge was cold. <laughs> yeah? Every month has an average of 30 days except the last month of pregnancy, which has about 1,330 days. <laughs> and one more. If you think their room is messy, just wait until it's empty. I have two boys that are grown, and their rooms are empty most of the year, and you feel it. You miss them, you know? So it makes you appreciate the mess a little bit more. You know, I've been a mother for 21 years now, and I was thinking this week that one of the most frightening things I have ever heard my children say to me, most frightening things, is just six simple words, and yet it strikes fear in you as a parent. And those words are, Mom... Can I borrow the car? <laughs> There's something about those words that as a parent, you just, it strikes fear in you. You know, when your kids turn 16 or 17 or 18, depending on how motivated they are and how restraining you are, they want to drive. And you worry about them as drivers. You worry for their safety, but you also worry about the other crazy drivers that are out there. And I remember telling a friend when Ben started driving, when he got his driver's license and he began to leave and go off on his own, I remember telling a friend that my prayer life just soared to new heights <laughs> with him driving. And so on this Mother's Day, I want to talk about prayer. And there's a story in the book of Acts chapter 1 that has always been a little troubling to me, a bit odd even. And just to give a little background that I would have given last week, the disciples are gathered together and Jesus gives them some final instructions and then he ascends to heaven. And one of the first things the disciples do as they're gathered in the upper room is that they decide to pick a replacement for Judas Iscariot. They decide to pick another 12th apostle. And so read this with me if you would out of Acts chapter 1 starting in verse 12. Again, it's a little odd that we're starting in the middle, but... If it doesn't bother God, let's not let it bother us. Fair enough? So I'm reading out a New Living Translation, Acts 1, starting verse 12. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, a distance of half a mile. And when they arrived, they went to the upstairs room of the house where they were staying. Here are the names of those who were present, Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, Simon, and Judas, son of James. And they all met together, were constantly united in prayer, along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, several other women, and the brothers of Jesus. 
And during this time, when about 120 believers were together in one place, Peter stood up and addressed them. Brothers, he said, the scriptures had to be fulfilled concerning Judas, who guided those who arrested Jesus. This was predicted long ago by the Holy Spirit speaking through King David. Judas was one of us and shared in the ministry with us. Judas had bought a field with the money he received for his treachery. Falling head first there, his body split open. I'm not sure why we're giving this detail, but we are. His body split open, spilling out his intestines. The news of his death spread to all the people of Jerusalem, and they gave the place the Aramic name, which means field of blood. So Peter continued, this was written in the book of Psalms where it says, let his home become desolate with no one living in it. It also says, let someone else take his position. So now we must choose a replacement for Judas from among the men who were with us the entire time we were traveling with the Lord Jesus. Notice this is the criteria. Notice this. We must choose a replacement for Judas among the men who were with us the entire time we were traveling with the Lord Jesus from the time he was baptized by John until the day he was taken from us. Whoever is chosen will join with us as a witness of Jesus' resurrection. So they nominated two men, Joseph also called Justice, and Matthias. Then they all prayed, O Lord, you know every heart. Show us which of these men you have chosen as the apostle to replace Judas in this ministry, for he has deserted us and gone where he belongs. Then they cast lots, and Matthias was selected to become an apostle with the other 11. So they picked this guy named Matthias. How many of you know a lot about Matthias? It's a trick question, me either. No one knows a lot about Matthias. We do know that he met the qualifications necessary to be an apostle. One of the 12, he traveled with Jesus the entire time of Jesus' ministry. He was, from the time of John, he was a witness of the resurrection and the ascension. Two men, actually, at least two men met those requirements, and they cast lots, and they picked a guy named Matthias. But honestly, this story has always kind of bugged me. Because Matthias is never mentioned again in the New Testament. Only here. He seemingly had no long-term impact. Maybe no impact. And I've always wondered, did the disciples make a mistake? Did they miss God here? Wouldn't it make more sense if the apostle Paul had been chosen to be the 12th apostle? Or perhaps even James, Jesus' brother, who became the head of the church. They picked a guy named Matthias who we've never hear of again. And I thought, God, did they miss it? Is that what God wanted? And just in furthering my contemplation, the disciples cast lots to make this decision. Now, that was a biblically approved method for decision making. Proverbs 16.33 tells us that. But apart from this story in the book of Acts, casting lots is never used again in the New Testament. And it appears that when the Holy Spirit fell on the disciples on the day of Pentecost, they didn't need to cast lots anymore because they could rely on the Holy Spirit to give them guidance. And so just follow my argument, but with that in mind... Jesus told the disciples to wait until the day of Pentecost to wait. And so my thought was, should they have waited until that day when the Holy Spirit fell, and then they would have been able to make the right decision? So honestly, for many years, I have wondered, did the disciples make a mistake? But in studying the book of Acts to teach it, you look, through it, you look at it through a different lens than when you just read it. And studying to teach it, I saw a couple of things as I studied it more thoroughly and more carefully. In verse 14, it says, they all met together and were constantly united in prayer. In verse 23 and 24, it says, so they nominated two men and then they prayed. Twice the scripture says very clearly, very emphatically that they prayed about it. They were united in prayer about it. It wasn't a flippant decision, they prayed. And yet still, based on my human reasoning, and I'm, that's very flawed, but based on my flawed human reason, reasoning, even though they prayed about it, did they still make a mistake? Because sometimes I think we can pray about a decision 
We can pray about something and make a decision, and then later the decision doesn't make sense. Has that ever happened to you like it has to me? And we can ask questions like, did I miss God? Do I not hear God? Does God not hear me? Is prayer even worthwhile? Is prayer a vain exercise? And the enemy can take it to the extreme of why pray? Why bother? And yet God commands us to pray. And in the book of Acts, there are 31 references to prayer, more than any other book in the New Testament. And almost every significant event Prayer precedes almost every significant event in Acts. The Bible makes it clear that if we want God's blessing, if we want his effectiveness, if we want his help, then we've got to first choose to stop and pray about things. And with that, I think we have to choose that God is leading us even if later it doesn't make sense. You know, the crucifixion of Jesus did not make sense to the disciples at the time. Would you agree? Peter living so much of the last days of his life in prison, instead of being able to to pray for and speak to the multitudes, he, he lived in prison. That didn't make sense. And yet he had more than enough time to write some letters. See, we aren't always good judge of things. We don't always have God's perspective. So as I was studying this chapter and really researching it and studying it more thoroughly, even though circumstances might suggest that the disciples made a mistake in choosing Matthias, I now don't think they did. The New Testament nowhere condones or condemns the way the apostles made the decision. And while Matthias is never mentioned again in the New Testament, nearly most of the other apostles aren't mentioned either. Church history records that Matthias died a martyr for Jesus, as did all the other disciples with the exception of John. And Paul was definitely more prominent than Matthias, but he was also more prominent than most anyone. Right? except maybe Peter and John. And Paul would not have been qualified to be that 12th apostle based on the criteria that the Bible states. Someone who had to travel with Jesus, someone was there at the resurrection and the ascension. But we can look at stories like that in the Bible. Or better yet, we can look at stories in our own lives. And we can struggle with prayer. I prayed, God, but now it doesn't make sense. And the enemy will come to us and lie to us and say, prayer doesn't work. And you know, honestly, just being real here, I struggle with prayer because I'm a doer. I will gladly roll up my sleeves and get to work. Tell me what to do and I will work on it. But stop and pray. Wait and pray. Trust and pray. That's not natural for me. I don't know about you, but that's not natural for me. It's more natural for me to act and then ask God to bless it later (laughs) or ask God to rescue me later. That's more natural for me. But that's not what the Bible tells us to do. It says stop and pray. So you know what? God puts situations in my life like this to help me learn to stop and pray. Situations that I can't fix. I think we can also struggle with prayer because we make it so complicated. We talk about prayer postures and prayer places and prayer languages and prayer shawls and prayer beads and prayer journals and prayer closets and prayer lists and prayer patterns. And we can make it so complicated and write methodology and write write patterns and write systems that we lose prayer in all the details. See, I like to pray and worship God on Saturday night in the sanctuary between six and seven o'clock on Saturday night. It's my routine. I've been doing it for quite a while when I have the sermon the next day. But last Saturday, I just had a super busy day, and I got busy, and I decided I wanted to go see my mom, and then I got delayed. And by the time I got home, it was later than I wanted to go, and I decided I'm not going to go to the church and pray tonight. But honestly, I felt a twinge of guilt about that. But guilt changed to gratitude that fast. 
Because God sees all things and we don't. And if we're praying, we can trust that he is moving. And sometimes we see the evidence of that and sometimes we don't. But we can make prayer complicated and then we can struggle with this thing called unanswered prayer. Times when God is silent. And we can wonder, does God even want to talk to me? Does he even have time? You know, we've hired a lawyer uh, for my dad's estate. And I've called this guy over and over again. He won't call me back. It's like, why hire a lawyer if you can't get in touch with him? And I've thought, is that the way we feel about prayer with God? Sometimes I call you and I'm not getting a call back. As we struggle with unanswered prayer. And we can think, is God too busy? I mean, he's the creator of the universe, is the almighty. Does he not have time to hear from me? And with all of these conflicting thoughts that the enemy brings, mixed with all of these issues, the enemy lies to us and says only certain people are gifted in prayer. They're called intercessors. And I'm not one of those. I can't go on 40-day prayer retreats or do two-hour pre-dawn prayer sessions. So prayer must not be my thing. And the enemy convinces us that God doesn't hear, God doesn't care, it won't make a difference anyway. Why pray? Why bother? But what if God's idea of prayer was something different than what we've made it? Something more simple, something manageable, something more doable? What if prayer was just meant to be an ongoing conversation with a friend? Not some program, not some complicated system, not a plethora of eloquent theological ritual words, but rather just a simple conversation. And it doesn't matter where it happens or how it happens or when it happens, it just matters that it happens. I want to look at what I think is the first recorded prayer in the New Testament that's made to Jesus, the very first one, first prayer made to Jesus. And you know what it was? It was just a conversation, simple, uncomplicated. Jesus goes to a wedding, and at this wedding, they have a problem. They've run out of wine, and you can read that story out of John chapter 2 and not know the details and not know the history and not know the culture and just kind of pass over it and think, so what? They ran out of wine, served some punch, you know? But uh, culturally, in this generation, culturally, this would have been a major disaster for the groom and his family. It was culturally unacceptable to run out of wine. It would be something that would be talked about maybe even for years and soon forgotten. It would bring shame and humiliation to the groom's family. And running out of wine was more than just embarrassing. It broke a strong unwritten code or law of hospitality. Biblical commentaries have even suggested that running out of wine could result in a lawsuit. Somebody suing the groom's family. You think we have frivolous lawsuits today? They did back then too. So Jesus is at this wedding, as is his mother. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, approaches Jesus and just says this simple phrase, they have no wine. Again, I would suggest that this is the first prayer recorded to Jesus in the New Testament. They have no wine. Just four words in English. So simple, a statement of a problem. And I was thinking, you know, on this Mother's Day, what can we learn from the way that Mary approached, the way that Mary prayed, if you will? You know, she knew Jesus better than anyone at this point. And, and as I looked at this, you know, she doesn't come to Jesus, and I'm putting this in quotes, in prayer, telling him how to fix this problem. You've got to do this and that and this. She's not bossy. She's not demanding. Do you ever feel like you get demanding in your prayers with God? Don't answer that. But she doesn't over-spiritualize the problem. She doesn't say, if you really were the son of God, they wouldn't have run out of wine. She doesn't over-spiritualize it. Sometimes I think we do that. And she doesn't pull rank. She doesn't say, I'm your mom, and you need to fix this. She simply says, they have no wine. She presents the problem to him. 
And you know, when I have a problem like our sanctuary being damaged and unusable, it messes with my world and it gets to me. It got to me when I saw that hailstorm come and thought, we're going to have a contractor to work with. It got to me. It messed with me. But I'm preaching to myself here, but please hear me on this. But what if instead of allowing a problem to get to us, before that happens, we learn to instantly present that problem to Jesus? The minute we have a problem, you put it in a sentence and you present it to him. That's what Mary did. And what I am learning for my own life, and I think we're learning this all together, is that I was never meant to carry my problems by myself. And I wonder if the reason why we as Americans get so tired and so stressed and so overwhelmed, do you know what I'm talking about? So overwhelmed, is be- the reason for that is because we are carrying problems that we were never meant to carry alone. Because we have a loving, caring father who says, cast your cares on me. They have no wine. And Jesus' response fascinates me. He says, what does that have to do with us? My hour has not yet come. And I thought, he talks to his mom the way my kids talk to me. (laughs) What's that got to do with us? See, Jesus didn't go to this wedding with the intention of doing a miracle. This wasn't a part of the plan. He just went as a guest. He hadn't even yet performed any public miracles, and he said, my time hasn't even come yet to start doing that. And yet she brings him the problem, and with his response, she doesn't argue. She doesn't demand his immediate attention, saying, do you realize that time is passing and I need an answer really right now, if not yesterday? But look what she does. She takes the problem to him. They have no wine. She hears his response, and this is what she does. She says to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. And honestly, I always put myself in these situations, but... I think she walked away probably thinking Jesus wasn't going to do anything. You think? Because he said, my hour has not yet come. What does that problem have to do with us? She walked away perhaps thinking that Jesus wasn't going to do anything, but she took the problem to God in prayer, left it with him, and says, whatever he says, that's what I want. And you know, this teaches me that prayer is not so much about asking God to do what I want. Prayer is about asking God to do what is right. And then trusting him with results, even if later it doesn't make sense. Like I gave you in Acts chapter 1. Amen? Yeah? See, prayer isn't about ordering God around. It's not telling him our timetable and when we think this needs to be fixed or solved. God is not a giant vending machine that if we just do prayer right, if we just put in the right amount of money, if we have the right strategy, we just push the right buttons, then the vending machine will give us a prize. That's not what prayer is about. Prayer is about having an ongoing conversation with a friend who happens to be the Almighty. See, to pray without ceasing, I believe, is to live in a continual awareness of God. Knowing that God is always with you. Brother Lawrence wrote a book called Practicing His Presence. It's having a constant and comforting connection. God wants to have us to have a constant connection with him. See, I think genuine, pure prayer is presenting ourselves to God and just saying, we're walking this road together. And it's presenting our problems to him and saying, what you want is what I want. It's an exercise of trust. It's a form of worship. It's a declaration of faith. Your will be done. Isn't that what your will be done means? What you want is what I want. Your will be done. And you know, one of the benefits of learning to practice his presence is that we begin to recognize his voice. Ken and I are celebrating 26 years of marriage this week. And thank you. 
And I have spent so much time with Ken that we can be in a big room and I can recognize his voice. He could call me for another room and I would know it was him. I've spent so much time with him, I recognize his voice. And I would propose to you that if you want to get good at hearing God's voice, practice his presence. Spend time with him through worship, through prayer. See, I know Ken well enough that if someone came and said to me, Ken said such and such, I would know Ken did not say that. Ken did not say, let's go smoke a cigarette. It's just, it's just not going to happen, okay? But see, as we practice God's presence, spending time with him in prayer, in worship, in reading, and memorizing his word, in praising him, turning on that light switch, praising him in the good times and bad, as we begin to spend time with him, we will begin to recognize what it is his voice and what is not his voice. Because see, fear always wants to have a voice. Insecurity and condemnation always have something to say. But if you view prayer not as some formal, ritualistic, ceremonial, must-do exercise, but rather if you view prayer as a continual conversation with God, living in God's presence, then you will begin to recognize what's God's voice and what, what is not God's voice. To have this continual connection with God, no, sin breaks that connection, it does. Sin breaks that connection, but it's so easy to reconnect. It's not like the internet sometimes. It's so easy. You know what you have to do? You just have to say, I sinned. And you have to own it and repent. And you know what happens? Jesus was beaten and broken for us so that there's a reconnection. You know, for me personally, I spend time every day just first thing in the morning praying before God. But I don't want that to be, that's done, chink, chink. I want to have this constant communion with God, having this constant conversation with a friend. Lord, I need help with this. I mean, it can be as silly as God, I need help finding a parking place. You say, well, God doesn't want to bother with that. But you know what? If it matters to you, it matters to God. If it matters to you, it matters to him. I can't tell you how many times I've prayed and asked for a parking place and God has given it to me that fast. And I can't tell you how many times I've prayed and asked for a parking place and I had to park way far away. <laughs> and I don't understand that. But I know this, I'm going to have a continual conversation with my Lord. Like he's my best friend because he is. Jesus responded to Mary's prayer. He responded, I think, to her faith. Her faith said, whatever he, do, whatever he says, do it. And she walked away. That's faith. Isn't it? So Jesus told the wedding attendants to fill six tall pots of water. And I taught this years ago and researched it. That water that they got is called non-potable water. In other words, it wasn't drinking water. It was like sewer water. So sometimes when we're in a drought, you'll see them, uh, uh, what am I trying to say, spraying a field with a sprinkler system, and they'll have a big sign that says non-potable water. That means don't drink that. It has not been purified. It is not clean. It will make you sick. That's the water that they use to fill these six large pots, okay? So I can only imagine as the people that filled them watched as somebody took a cup of it and handed it to the head waiter, like, mm-mm-mm-mm-mm. mm 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 and he tastes it, and it's not water or dirty, gross water anymore. What is it? It's the wine. Not just any wine. It's top-of-the-line wine. And you know what? Jesus didn't just, I've never seen this before, but Jesus didn't just care about, qual, about quantity. He, oh, let me get this right. Jesus didn't just care about quality, how good the wine was. He cared about quantity. I'd never seen this before. I read that those six tall water pots, and I read this in various places, six tall water pots filled to the brim would be the equivalent of 900 to 1,000 bottles of wine today. <laughs> the, the groom could have opened a wine store. But I want you to see something here. Because of Mary's prayer, the whole party got blessed. Right? 
And I think if we become people that pray all the time and present problems to God, it may not just bless us, it may bless multitudes. Blessed because a person took a problem to God. So learning from that, if we pray, it can impact many. But on the flip side, in Acts chapter 1, they prayed, they picked a guy named Matthias. We never hear of him again. It doesn't seem like he had a lot of impact because we never hear of him again. We don't know. But it can appear, at least on the surface, that that prayer had no impact at all. And so my conclusion is this. God wants us to know that if we pray with a sincere, repentant, humble heart, he is listening. And he is moving whether we see an immediate huge impact or not. And I am going to trust him whether I see a huge impact or not. And I want to live with whatever he says, that's what I want. You know, on this Mother's Day, I want to close with this. One of our responsibilities as mothers, as fathers, as aunts, as uncles, as brothers, as sisters, as grandparents, is to pray for the generation behind us. To pray that they will have their own personal encounter with God. To pray that they will walk in righteousness. To pray that they will follow God with all of their hearts all the days of their lives. To pray that they will experience the healing power of Jesus in our lives. So to close this morning, let's just close in prayer. And I'm going to say it this way. If you're in your 80s, pray for people in their 60s. If you're in your 70s, pray for people in their 50s. If you're in your 60s, pray for my generation, people in their 40s. If you're in your 20s, pray for people that are younger than you. Pray for the people that are behind you. Because I want you to see this. Prayer is inviting God into your world. Prayer is inviting God into your world. So let's pray. Will the worship team come on up here? Let's pray. Pray for the generation behind you. Will you stand with me? Father, we want to live in constant companionship with you. That's the way we want our prayer lives to be, Father. And we want to be able to come to present to you, God, they have no wine of our issues in life. So, Father, teach us to pray. The one thing the disciples asked Jesus to teach them was to teach them to pray. It's the only thing they asked Jesus to teach them. I think the reason we talk about prayer so much up here is because I just feel like life is a school of prayer. It's learning to pray. So right now, whether you feel like you're an expert at prayer or whether you're a beginner, it doesn't matter. It just matters that you pray. So will you pray for the generation behind you? Pray to yourself. You can pray out loud. But would you just pray for people that are 20 years younger than you? If you're you're under 20, pray for people that are younger than you. You're a teenager. Pray for the children. Father, would you stir faith in us? Jesus, I'm convinced the reason you responded to Mary was because of her faith. Whatever he says, do it. Would you work that kind of faith in us? You just pray that for yourself. God, would you work that kind of faith in me? Whatever he says, do it. Whatever you want, God. Not what I want, God, but your will be done. God, what you want, what is right. Teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. Just for-